Hey cozy homies, welcome back to the zone. So for today, I'm going to make a video about a book that I've read many many months ago. So I read this book called Dollar and Cents by Dan Arely and Jeff Chrysler. I read this book back then in like probably October or November last year. And I always wanted to make a video about this, but I just couldn't wrap my head around how I'm going to present it. So finally, after months of preparation, I finally got myself to do this. Huh? So today I'm going to share a few what I've learned from this book. In essence, right, this book is just teaching us about the psychology behind why we like to spend a lot of money. And most of the time, I feel like a lot of people usually overspend what they expected themselves to spend. Huh? This book gives us a lot of insight about how we can actually look at why, uh, what are some of the psychological factors and the limitations of our own like human nature that cause us to do a lot of spending that sometimes isn't very necessary. I feel very passionate about this topic because I feel like this is really applicable to our real life and we are at this juncture where we start to earn a bit of money, getting our first pay, right? I feel like it's really good for us to understand why we usually have really bad spending habits uh, and how we can get about it. Let's just go right into the introduction. Alright, so this book tells us what exactly is money. So what is money? It is actually a messenger of worth and has in itself no value. So what it means to be a messenger of worth, right, is that actually money itself isn't valuable. The value that we have in money is, comes from the trust that we have in money. So if you think about it, it's kind of like this, it, like you just take a few cents to print out this piece of paper that become money, right? But it is the trust we have in the government and in the bank they give us the value of that piece of paper. So whenever like, we use this piece of paper and we give it to other people, it kind of has this like, universal truth in it, such that this piece of paper it represents, the, like, for example, $2 or $5 that we use to purchase an item. But in essence, right, there are four features of money. Money is general, it is divisible, it is fungible, and it's storable. So what it means is that yeah, like money is general in terms of its usage. Everyone can have access to money, everyone can use money. It is at like a common denominator for the entire country where everybody has the same a like, unit which they can use on uh, to make purchases and transactions. It is divisible, I guess it's understandable. So like a $50 note can be divided into five $10 notes. It can be divided into you know $51 coins. So money itself is um, divisible. Uh. Money is fungible. What fungible means, right, is that it is actually, like, everywhere it go, the money is, like, the same value, lah. So, for example, you know, like, everywhere you go in Singapore, you no matter if you're at Bishan, or you're at Topayo, you're at, like, Sengkang or whatever, right, everywhere you go, right, the $1 coin represents $1 of value, and all Singaporeans can agree on that. So this is what fungible means. And, yes, lastly, money is storable. So, you know, look at our piggy banks, and we store our uh, coins and our savings, right. All these are storable like in a sense, money is storable. With money comes the concept of value. What value is right, basically like how much um, yeah, like how much value we place in the item. And for humans right, it is very difficult to actually be able to tell what the true value of the item is. Because with the invention of money right, we tend to associate money as an um, indication of value. It is a good way to uh, use money as a way to represent value, but humans tend to overthink and misinterpret uh, this representation of money as value. Normally how we judge right, how much an item is worth, we use things called value cues. So value cues right, are basically cues that we believe are associated with real value of the item. But oftentimes it might not actually be accurate la, in terms of how we um, judge it. All this right, can be attributed to our own uh, human limitations because we all um, tend to just like, misinterpret and misunderstand certain ways of how um, the price is being set and how uh, we, we humans like uh, respond to changes in prices and just the price in general. Like. So humans just have to believe in inaccurate value cues most of the time and I think this is the main reason why we all fall for so many of those uh, traps that let us to you know, spending too much. Uh. So let me just dive right into the main portion of this video. So this book tells us there are three types of people in this world, okay? So first of all, there is the perfectly rational person. This person knows exactly how they want to spend their money. So they know, okay, this month I'm going to budget everything properly. I make sure I have enough savings, I don't overspend. I have a very strict regulated like schedule and protocol in terms of how I want to spend my money. But, as you all know, this person doesn't exist. <laughs> okay, next, we have a somewhat rational person with cognitive limitations. So this person is like, okay, I want to spend a certain amount of money, I don't want to overspend, I want to have some savings in my bank as well. But, 
I am limited in terms of my own brain space and thinking. You're like, okay, so what are the best saving plans out there? You're not sure. Or like, if you learn economics, you know about this problem of imperfect knowledge when it comes to the market. So you know like, oh, for example, I want to buy this item and right in front of me, it's worth $50. But the thing is, you don't know that actually, you know, down across the road, the other market sells this item for $40. And maybe if you buy it online, probably you can get it for $20. So you know, because of this imperfect knowledge, we are not able to uh, find the so-called the best deal, the like best bet like, for the item that we want to purchase. Yeah, because of this, we tend to overspend uh, most of the time. I feel like overspending is uh, the biggest problem here uh, when we enjoy this entire conversation. So yep, for somewhat rational with cognitive limitations, probably some people fall under this category, but most people fall under the third category, which is a person with cognitive limitations as well as full of emotions. Yep, we are always very emotional and we have very limited processing power, right? So in this video, what I'm going to do is divide this video into two parts where one part we're talking about the emotional aspect of how we spend money as well as the cognitive limitations aspect of how we spend money. Okay, so basically, right, this book, they didn't really categorize in terms of this uh, format. So I think the book gave us uh, 11 or 12 common mistakes that humans like, tend to make when it comes to spending. And for me, what I want to do is actually use those concepts in this book I tried to organize it nicely like with this small little nice um, formatted uh, bits and pieces for y'all to absorb. Okay, so first, let me go into the aspect of cognitive limitations. So one of the most basic problems right, that most humans actually face right, is this concept of relativity. It is very difficult for us like, to actually grasp this concept of relativity. And the main reason why it is so difficult, because it is not easy to directly measure and compare the value of items. As we all know, right, like this whole problem of imperfect knowledge, we don't really know exactly what is the true cost of production behind making this product. And sometimes, you know, um, certain markets and sellers tend to like just overhype the item and just kind of like make the price look like exceptionally high and they just use different kinds of like gimmicks and tricks to like trick you to thinking that it's actually worth the price. But because we don't really know the relative price compared to other sellers, the relative price to its own basic cost of production, right? We tend to like make the uh, incorrect like decisions when it comes to purchasing the item. This phenomenon right is exceptionally observable right when it comes to things like discounts and bargains. So something to say like oh there's a fifty percent discount or like second item at fifty percent off, and a lot of people think that this is actually a good deal right. But perhaps it isn't really that much of a good deal considering the for example the cost of production and everything that goes behind um, selling these products. Uh. So yeah, another aspect of how relativity is in place, for example, if you want to purchase this $250,000 worth of uh, this car, okay, so this car is worth $250,000. So you're going to buy this car, and then they're like, oh, you know, if you just spend an extra $200, you can first get this um, CD player that can connect to your Spotify and like, play songs or whatever. Oh, maybe you can add on another $10 for this extra service, another $50 for this extra package, another $200 for this and that, this and that, this and that. And you're like, okay, you know what, all these miscellaneous fees, I'll just pay for it lah. Because, you know, I already put in so much money to buy these $250,000 worth of items, right? But it's, it's extra this $200, $300, you know. But if you think about it, right, if you compare like this $200 of items to a $250,000 car, you will think, okay, maybe $200 isn't that much. But if you take it out of this context, for example, this book, right, costs $10. And with $200, you can buy 20 books. And if you think about it, perhaps in some situations, $200 would be a lot. But when it comes to this car situation, this $200 seems a lot lesser. But the matter of fact is that you're still spending $200. So the context actually doesn't really matter in this case, because ultimately we are still spending $200 of our pay, you know. And I feel like a lot of humans can't really grasp this concept like, because you think that, oh, you know, it's, it's just like a small like 0, 0.0 something percent of my big purchase. So I would just fuck up the extra money. But if we actually really think through all our financial decisions, right? Like you realize that all this kind of like, you know, might as well just spend a bit more, might as well just spend a bit more kind of concept, right? Or kind of mindset we have, tend to let us overspend in the long run. So keeping this in mind can perhaps help us save up uh, money like in terms of all these uh, miscellaneous fees that we pay like, on, the, on the side. Yep. And another uh, problem about relativity is that there's too many products in the market. For example, right, you know there's too many products in the market, then businesses tend to like just lump everything together in the form of like bundles and packages and value meals and everything. And all these right, actually are very effective marketing techniques to get us to spend more. 
So you think about it, for example, when you go for like a, a fast food restaurant, you can get like a burger, and it's like, oh, you can add on like $3, add on $5 for like extra fries and drinks and whatever, right? Then you're like, okay, you know what, since it's like one whole bundle, one whole package, it's easier to actually just get it like. But if you think about it, right, perhaps it is actually not a really good deal, considering how, if you compare like getting all these items like a la carte, right, because it's in a bundle, probably you only save a few cents, and it isn't actually that good of a deal, if you think about it sometimes. And because you know, with our cognitive limitations, right, humans we just tend to like, uh, just, not, just ignore all the, you know, the cents, how many cents, how many cents, we ignore all the different combinations that can get us the best deal and we just go for what companies just show to us because we're just too lazy to think um, think more like we're like okay this is in one bundle, one package so nicely wrapped up for me I just get it and you know just spend it lah but perhaps there are just better ways to get about it and perhaps you know you don't need the extra drinks or the extra set of fries that comes with the meal so these are things that we need to consider lah for in terms of this relativity concept the next concept we have is something we call Compartmentalization. So what this thing does, right, is that because you know how we do a lot of transactions in our daily life. For example, you pay electrical bills, water bills, you have to pay your car loan, you have to pay for rent, you have to pay for your school fees, you have to pay for this, pay for that, pay for clothing, pay for your food, pay for transportation. It's just too many things you need to pay for. So as humans, what evolution taught us, right, is to just use our brain and find ways to kind of like maximize the e efficiency in terms of our thinking processes. So this leads to something that most humans do, which is called compartmentalization, which is we put money in different mental accounts in our brain. So for example, in this account, like, okay, this is the necessities account. So I'm going to spend this money in this account for necessities like food and transportation. Then you have this entertainment category in your brain, you're like, okay, I need to spend this on like movies and concert tickets or whatever. And then you have others which is like uh, first charity work or you have like other accounts like um, socializing, going out with friends or buying them birthday gifts. That's, is, that's probably another account in your brain. So humans have to have a lot of all these different types of, of accounts like, that we use to segregate and separate our so-called like, salary and pay so that we all roughly know and estimate how much we want to spend. In theory, it's a good idea because you know having a very clear cut segregation and plan of how you want to use our money could help us, you know, in, help us like in the long run in terms of our savings and help us regulate our spending. But the problem of humans, right, is that we commit two types of like mistakes like when it comes to compartmentalizing. So one, the first mistake we have, right, is emotional accounting. We make these accounts based on our own emotions. So you're like, okay, you know, uh, you're like, oh, since I'm very young, right, I don't think I need to save that much money for my retirement yet. So let me just have a lot, of, just, let me just expand my entertainment uh, account to a larger portion and you spend more of your money on entertainment and you just, you know, savings aren't really that important I can't really feel the effects of it right now so I'll just um, cut down the amount of money I put in my savings account so if you think about it, it might not be the best idea because all these little bits of savings, right can eventually lead up to a very big amount of money like, that you can perhaps use in your retirement which is going to be very useful in the future so we just tend to do all this accounting emotionally and sometimes our emotions aren't really the most like rational people in control of our mind uh, right? and the second mistake we make is we have malleable accounting so the guidelines and the boundaries that you set for these accounts are malleable we tend to change it so for example you're like okay you know what I'm going for this big like French like, reunion in my high school or something so you're like, okay, you know what, for this month, perhaps I will just put my socializing account, I'll just make it a bit broader, and I'll just, you know, overlap into my savings account in my brain. So you now your savings account shrink again, and then your socializing account broadens, because you're like, entertain more friends this month. And you're like, okay, so this month I spent so much on my friends, right, next month I'll save more. But who knows, next month, you realize you have this, um, your colleague like in your work is gonna like retire and then they're throwing this big party and asking everyone to contribute to this party and you're like oh okay I mean it just once in a while uh, one of my good friends retire my sister just spend money to contribute to this big party and then your account changes again so you're like oh let me just cut down my savings let me expand my socializing account again so because of how we have this very like malleable and flexible boundaries is set to our accounts right we tend to overspend most of the time because we all know like the savings account is just the one where a lot of people can just exploit and use, exploit and use. Yeah. When we do these different types of accounting and compartmentalizing in our brain, make sure that our emotions have to be kept in check and make sure that the boundaries 
have to somewhat be fixed, like they have some um, discipline in it in uh, regulating these accounts. And the last point I want to talk about in this cognitive limitation section is our emphasis on evaluability. So humans, right, because we want to so-called make the best decision and the best uh, spending choices, we tend to evaluate a good. So we can see, okay, is this item really worth the money they're going to use to spend on? So what humans do is we tend to focus on quantifiable attributes. For example, it's like how many pixels on this television you're going to buy? How many percentage parity of this gold chain you're going to buy? So it's all these kind of numbers they're very fixated with. For example, like oh, like 64 gigabytes of storage, 128 gigabytes of storage. Or I can talk about oh, um, the dimensions of this new phone. Or like how heavy this thing is, the uh, colors and everything. So because we are very, we like to focus on all these quantifiable um, attributes, right? Things that is easily observable, things that is on paper, you can compare numbers to numbers. And because I think it's just how humans we like to um, do comparisons in our head, lah. Like we think this is like the more scientific way of uh, comparing items, having all these uh, very specific numbers that you can use to use as a common denominator and a common base unit to compare between different items. So, yep, it is actually easy to evaluate and sometimes it does give us a new perspective on how we want to make our purchases. But we have to take note that we just tend to over-focus on quantifiable attributes and the quality of this item sometimes it is being ignored. Lah. And yeah, because um, scientists do this research around right, people and they find out that actually, you know, uh, for example, okay, I mean, when you watch YouTube, you already know if it's 144 pixels versus 1080 pixels, right? There's a very vast difference. But many of the pixels above that, for example, like the, the 2160 or the 4K resolution, all those, right? Actually, most people can't really differentiate anymore in terms of how sharp the image is. Because as you reach all those very big numbers, right? Like that one, the human eye kind of just can't really tell the minute differences between all those items already. So you think about it, is it really worth the extra hundred over dollars to purchase a 4K television compared to like a regular 1080 one where we can actually get good enough resolution of images lah, that we are very comfortable with. So it is all these kind of things we need to keep in mind. Lah. Sometimes perhaps using numbers as the base unit isn't necessarily the best idea. It is a good way to um, compare items but it's not the only way, and I think it's what the book is trying to tell us. What this book also um, suggests to us, right, is you can consider using something called direct hedonic evaluation. So instead of using numbers and quantifiable uh, characteristics to compare items, we should just use our own personal pleasure as the base unit, not the money, not the numbers. So you just think about it, okay, if I use this item, do I feel happier? Or if I use the other item, do I feel happier? And this happiness should be the base unit that you use to determine your final uh, decision rather than all those numbers that use that kind of like just influence your um, thought process over and over again. Uh. Yeah. Next, we talk about the emotional tendencies that humans tend to have. This is very obvious. All of us humans, we like to avoid pain. And in this book, the, they give us this like kind of like formula of like pain. So they say pain equals to time plus attention. It is the time and the attention aspect that contributes to the pain that we feel when it comes to purchasing items. So the time is the time of purchase. So do we pay money before the experience, during the experience or after the experience? So what they told us is that the pain right, that we uh, actually have when we do purchases, right, it comes in the form of before, after and during. So if you pay before the experience, you feel the least amount of pain. If you pay after the experience, you feel moderate amount of pain. But when you pay during the experience, this is when you feel the most amount of pain. It is human nature to avoid pain, but sometimes it is good to know that having some pain when we do our transactions, right? It allows us to regulate our uh, purchases. Like if you see now, like, like a lot of companies tend to let us pay the item before we actually get it, and because this is the so-called the least pain-inducing way, like, to get us to spend money, so. It's good for us to keep this in mind when we buy something before experiencing it. Do you think it is actually really that worth it? And next, it comes to attention. So the more attention you put into the actual act of spending money, the more pain you will feel. So for example, if you actually you know, take out your wallet and take out those uh, pieces of $50 notes they're going to spend on this item, you really can feel the pain because you can actually see the numbers just going off right in front of you. And to 
so called ease the pain, right? Like technologies allow us to have like credit cards, like this, you know, this cashless society kind of like movements, or like free items. All these kind of things kind of just numb the pain by reducing the attention we have on these items. So if you make transactions so smooth, you know, like everything just goes, like just one wave of the card, just tap the card on the reader, and everything is done. And sooner or later, you realize that your bank account just goes to like zero dollars without you even knowing about it. So yeah, because of the amount of attention we have, we don't put into our transactions, we perhaps will just overspend without actually knowing about it. Like. And yeah, it is important for us to take note of this uh, time and attention um, aspects when it comes to inducing pain in ourselves. So it is good to have some healthy pain in our daily lives so that we can keep our um, transactions in check. Like. I believe this is my own personal take. But it's good for all of us to know that these are some things that humans tend to overlook. Like. So not only we are pain avoiders, we are also pleasure seekers. We love to seek pleasure. So what uh, this book talks about is that humans tend to fall for the magic of language and rituals. So let me tell you more about this drink for example. So this is green tea. Made from Japan. And it is, um, the tea leaves that they use are carefully picked and created from this um, very luscious tea um, fields, right? fields of tea leaves. And they are hand carefully handpicked by the tea pickers. And they just really bring it to the factory. They really brew it for many hours to soak out the flavours of the green tea leaves. And on top of that, they also have high grade, high quality jasmine flowers that is, they use to mash it together with the tea leaves. And it infuses the flavours together so perfectly nicely, balancing out with this natural blend of sweetness and this aroma and this whole multifaceted of layers of flavours come together perfectly to give us this beverage. And yep, this is how they market it. And in reality, this is just a random packet of green tea that's like a few cents lying in the market. So, does the description make you feel like this tea is really worth the, the price? You feel like, wow, you're really getting the freshness of the tea from high up in the mountains and everything. Yeah, you do feel the pleasure listening to all these nice descriptions of um, items, right? And yeah, sometimes uh, the way they market these kind of items can really enhance the experience lah, when the consumption experience that we're having with this item. Right? And this actually increases our willingness to pay for the item. If you think about it, sometimes you go to restaurants, they market all their items on the menu to be some really like out of this world, fantasy, like you know, magical dish, like the once in your life experience. But honestly, perhaps sometimes, you know, it is really not worth the high price that you need to pay to get these kind of goods. And it is just something for us to keep in mind uh, that we like to fall for all this like language, these visuals, the advertisements. Humans, we tend to fall for this a lot. Like, you know, knowingly or unknowingly, it's part of our subconscious mind already. Next, humans, we really trust ourselves, okay? We trust ourselves more than we trust other people. I think this is just a common uh, human trait. Lah. So, um, there are a few problems with uh, trusting ourselves. Uh, this is a bit technical here. So, the first one is technical anchoring. So, what anchoring is, is that we humans, right, we need to come to a conclusion with irrelevant information. The term anchoring comes from an anchor. So, you know, for example, when you set sail in the Titanic or those big ships, right, those anchors and they reach shore to keep themselves grounded. And what humans have to do is that sometimes they will hear very re irrelevant, very random, like, bits and pieces of information that kind of actually influences their final financial decision. So sometimes they hear like rumours of like, oh like, uh, that, oh you know this special tea leaf can cure cancer or whatever. Or can say, wow this good is like a super food and eating this can let you to have like longevity, you can like you know, forever be young and everything like this. And then right, we actually see the item in the supermarket, you are like, oh wait a minute, I think I read this on the internet somewhere that you have a lot of health benefits. So you know what, it is like, $100 for like 12 grams of this item, I'm just gonna get it anyway because of how good everything uh, is being marketed. And this is a problem of anchoring because we anchor our minds into very unsolid grounds and because of that we actually make unsound decisions in the end, which is not really desirable. Lah. Another problem we have is something called herding. So herding is this, this thing of like, you know like how when we do like vaccinations and everything, this is herd immunity. It's kind of like the same thing in terms of herd, like as in a, a social group. So what this thing means is that it is we assume something to be of high value because others appear to value it highly. For example, like if you go to this um, group of friends, and everyone's like, oh my god, you need to get this new like beauty product, you know, it's all over TikTok, it's all over Instagram, we all love it so much. And you know, it's a bit costly, but you know, my skin feels so good after putting this facial mask on and everything. And then you're like, oh, if everybody likes it so much, I should just get it also. But then when you actually receive the item and you use it, you realize that 
hmm, perhaps you know the older brand of um, facial mask that I use is actually much better than this one. But because everybody hype it up so much, you really think it's actually um, worth the money. So we need to keep this in mind. If like this, if everybody around you kind of like just hypes up an item so much, perhaps it is good. Perhaps it is really um, worth the quality. It really has a quality like that is worthy of all their praises. But we just need to keep in mind that sometimes. Things just get overhyped la, and it might not actually be the best item for you to get. So you just really need to consider. It's all about putting in the effort to really think through this blanket of loud noises influencing your decisions. And lastly, under this trusting ourselves section, we there is this part of loss aversion. So humans right, we have this preference to avoid losses than to acquire equivalent gains. And because of this, we kind of hold on and continue doing bad financial habits and decisions. And we refuse to just think through it and just you know give up on all these toxic and unhealthy habits that we have last time. So for example, one of the most famous examples would be in terms of stocks, lah. Like. So when we have uh, purchased these stocks, so for example, oh, I did bought these stocks for five years and ten years already, and then you start to see that oh the price of this stock is really going down. But the thing is, because you regularly invest money in this stock, you're like oh you know, I already spent like thirty thousand, three hundred thousand dollars in this stock. I cannot just withdraw from it like that. It's like you, know, you invested so much money in it, even though it is dropping. You're like, you know what? I already monitored this for a good five to ten years. I'm very sure it will be okay. But the thing is, a lot of telltale signs really tell you that okay, it is not good to keep on holding on to this because you are just losing lots of money. But you refuse to do it because you tell yourself, I already been putting so much money in this. How can I just throw all my thirty, three hundred thousand dollars away just like that? If you think about it, pro perhaps right. In the same time duration, if you just give up on buying the stock, and perhaps you try a new stock or perhaps try new investments, perhaps in a shorter amount of time you get better returns, and you can even earn more than continuing to purchase this item. Okay, so basically, sometimes we really need to sacrifice certain items and assets that we have in pursuit of better options out there. And you know, letting go of what we used to own is really difficult, lah. And we just need to keep in mind that there are. Possibly better options out there, and so we do not always try to just cling on to things that are not going well, lah. So it's a good way to just regulate and look through all our habits and see if they really need to be changed once in a while. Ah,、uh, lastly, for this emotional tendencies um section, we worry a lot about fairness and effort. So all of us humans, we tend to be very righteous. We think that oh, you need to have justice in society. You know, the things we buy must be made. With lots of effort, it has to be fair. It has to come from very justifiable sources and everything, which is a good mindset to have. But sometimes we tend to fall for certain fallacies, lah, and certain pitfalls in this mindset. So one thing about this aspect is that there's something called transparency asymmetry, which is that we only see our efforts. You can barely see other people's efforts. Is there this asymmetry in terms of the seller and the buyer? So the buyer, right? So for example, like when you do your own job, you're like, oh, you know, put in so much effort, time and effort, and so much hard work to make this item and everything. And then you see other people who also similarly, similarly market themselves to be hard workers. They put in lots of effort, you know, artisan coffee and whatever, right? But then you can't really see the efforts. You're telling yourself, wait a minute, why is the item so overpriced? Is the amount of effort they put in is it really equivalent to the price that they're setting? Because we can't really get to see the behind the scenes. You can't really see how they grind the coffee beans, the kind of high technology they use, the nitrogen infused, blah blah blah, kind of technology behind making this cup of artisan coffee. You are not sure whether you're actually paying the right amount for the amount of effort that they put in. So because of this, right, we kind of just like internal struggle. We're not sure whether exactly if what we are buying is worth the price. A lot of times, things that we think are fair and justifiable, right. Are actually going against the free market mechanism. I mean, yeah, this is not to say that the free market is always the best way of regulating a market. But sometimes you think about it, like based on the demand supply um free market economic model that ec that economists like to use, right? If you think about it, on rainy days, umbrellas should cost more, right? Because there's a greater demand for it, the price tends to go up. It's an upward pressure in the price, and it is logical for umbrellas to cost more. In the rain, and also if you think about it, taxi taxis right should also cost more when it's on snowy days, for example. Because there are snowy days, then there are like lesser taxi drivers willing to drive. It's more difficult to drive the taxi. It is um technically fair to charge higher on a snowy days. But as regular humans, we will think about it. 
how can you charge an umbrella much more on rainy days, you know? We desperately need an umbrella and you're just exploiting our human needs and everything. So it's this kind of like clash in interest, right, that cause us to really just go haywire in our brains like, like oh, why are we um, spending more on situations like this and it's not fair and then you're like, oh, you know, but I hate this company, I'm not gonna buy from there anymore. But in reality, right, they're just doing what is necessary for them to survive in this economic landscape. So it's all this kind of like mistakes that humans have to make, right, because what we perceive to be fair might not actually be the best cause of action for everybody. So to conclude this entire video, I know it's very chaotic. I am not. I am very certain I didn't really explain everything in de great detail, like, And I feel like I'm a bit rambling sometimes. So you know, if anything you want to clarify, please talk to me. I written my notes here, and I feel like my notes are much more clear and concise, like. So if you have any questions, please you know just go over to my Instagram. Leave it in the comment section down below. Like what are some um, key terms like, that you want me to explain and clarify with you because I feel like I'm not really doing a very good job explaining everything here today. So yep, my mistake. Yeah, it's okay. And yeah, so what this book tells us, right, to conclude this entire discussion about certain mistakes we tend to make when it comes to spending money, so what are some ways we can improve our financial decision making? So the first step, very importantly, is to raise awareness of our human fragility and our human frailty. So we need to narrow the knowledge gap between what businesses have and what we have in terms of our knowledge. Businesses, they kind of like, like to, they know the human weakness, they know how to exploit our weaknesses and get us to spend more. Secondly, we need to have an effective plan with very concrete steps on how we want to make better uh, decision making like, for our finances and money wise. So yeah, it's good to really just think through, um, for example, like how you want to make sure you have a very fixed budget, but perhaps in this of the mental accounting uh, compartmentalization we're talking about or perhaps you can tell us find ways to like you know regularly check our transactions when you use like credit cards or your cards to uh, pay money and all those all these are just a tiny steps you can take to really um, regulate your spendings up. Yeah. and to end on this video let me just tell you the three different types of de decisions that all of us have to make when it comes to um, finances so for big decisions involving lots of money, we definitely need to sit down and really thoroughly consider whether everything that we spend is actually really worth the money. For small decisions, regular random decisions like, okay, should I get like a $3 bento set, $5 bento set, $10 bento set for lunch, all these kind of small decisions, it is good to think about it, but don't think too much, okay? You know, you want to feel happy when you spend your money. You don't want to constantly be like, oh my god, I want to save this $1, this 20 cents, you know, where should I go and find the best way to save the money? If you think like this all the time, right, it's really going to negatively impact your mental health. So just um, spend in reasonable amounts. Sometimes, you know, you can just close one eye and say, okay, you know, I know that companies are trying to exploit my money, but I really just want to try this um, new item on the menu. I really just want to, you know, uh, purchase this item and just really enjoy and appreciate it. Just go ahead, okay? Make do what makes you happy. But just, you know, don't fall for these traps um, too consistently. Like, you have to be aware that you're actually spending this money and you have to be very aware of the pleasure and benefits that you can get out of it. And lastly, most importantly, is repeated decisions. So monthly subscriptions, all the things that they pay regularly. We have to stop and we look once in a while and see whether it is really worth uh, to sustainably continuing uh, this uh, regular transactions uh, for like very like habitual consumption. It's good for us to think about it once in a while, but sometimes you realize that oh it's really uh, I'm really um, just financing a bad habit for myself. For example, like smoking. Just think about it if in the long run, perhaps cutting down on some of these purchases could help you like save up money in the future. So yeah, these are some of the tips that the book has uh, told us. Uh. And yeah, I just want to say this video is quite messy, I guess, because there's a lot of concepts I want to talk about, but I can't really go in depth. And I feel like my explanation isn't really um, super well done this time around. But if you have anything you want to clarify, anything you discuss with me, please do discuss with me, because I really want to talk to you more about um, this in detail, like uh, perhaps individually, if anything, just feel free to come forward and talk to me about it. I am more than happy to discuss uh, this topic with you. So yeah, remember to like, share and subscribe and hope to see you guys in my next video. See you guys, bye!